and thanks everybody here for joining us. I, I know that our, our time is valuable and also the things that we're expected to deliver results wise is very, very high. Uh, so my intention is to keep this nice and brief. I promise 20 minutes and uh, offer some time up for questions and really focus on the things that matter. Um, I'm gonna share my screen in just a moment here, but I, I did wanna say a few things first. To start this off, the way that we really looked at this, I did some research and I actually had a wonderful opportunity to work with a, another researcher uh, named Admiral Bill Cross. He happened to be my father. He's the co-author of the book uh, that Derek mentioned. And I asked him one time, he was a Navy fighter pilot. He was a commander of a nuclear aircraft carrier and admiral of a battle group before he retired. Now he's a lot calmer than when I grew up, by the way. But I asked him one time with a corporate side of view, this is back in about 2012, I was like, I, it is so frustrating. We have all those people with talent, education, they work 50, 60 hours a week, not all of them, but most of them do. And then, but the disparity between performance is just stunning with that. And I know some people are naturally talented, harder workers. And then he told me about how they train people to be pilots, to be naval officers, to be, you know, things with terminal consequences, right? And I said, hmm, we don't do that. <laughs> we don't do a lot of those things. And I really thought, started thinking, why not? And so we started doing some research and ended up into a book. We spent a week down at NASA with the chief astronaut's office watching them train astronauts. And by the way, no one knows how to be an astronaut. They have to learn it from scratch, everyone. We looked at pilots, we looked at a police academy, we went and met with surgeons, we went to Green Bay Packers training camp and watched them for a week and just really wanted to see how they developed people using performance, coaches, teams, but a lot of simulations and a lot of war games that I'll talk to along the way. And let me go ahead and start sharing once we talk about that. It is what we call, what if something goes wrong? How do we improve performance in our corporate environments the same way that people do when they have binary consequences, which may or may not be terminal. So the things I will be addressing today, by the way, these are not necessarily things that we are doing at Amazon Web Services. I'm not gonna go into anything confidential that we do, but we have a dedication to high performance and to delivering results. We are customer obsessed. We have a number of leadership principles that base us upon. And I think you'll find some parallels of what we believe in at AWS and what you see in some of these other places that really have an incentive to make sure their people are prepared for any circumstance. So what we're gonna to cover today, really, uh, first of all, the first two I'm gonna blow through really quickly, uh, the traits of high performers that we discussed along, discovered along the way, uh, how do coaches improve performance, and then how we use simulations and war games as a coaching mechanism. If the output is outstanding performance, continuous improvement, and their ability to handle anything we throw at them, then that's what we'll be doing going forward using this as a tool. Of course, there's lots of other things that are involved um, and we'll address those along the way, but this is something we can always go back to. And before we start thinking about, well, how do I know if it'll work here? Or my company might not be this way. This is based on a lot of those uh, concepts that Anders Ericsson outlined in the book. Um, that you'll see from Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers and lots of other deliberate practice practitioners. This is how people improve. And the more elite they are, the more important it is. So we define this as when we look at the beginning of that, think about who uses this. Aviation, special operators, firefighting, astronauts. They have terminal consequences. It's not one of those, hey, nice, nice job trying to land the plane better luck next time when we try it again. Eh, or astronauts, you know, you could get a nice permanent ride to a very far away destination by just doing one or two things wrong. So they incessantly rehearse things and do simulations. And they actually, what we'll talk about later, a form of simulation is wargaming where we use competitive teams against each other to figure out how we could do things different. So along the way, um, try to think about the applications of how I would do something similar. They all boil down to deliberate practice, though. The thing that Anders Ericsson put on top of Malcolm Gladwell's, 
one of the differences here, and I heard Dar Derek talk about it, deliberate practice is thoughtful, difficult practice where you're constantly escalating a little bit. So for example, if you were trying to learn how to play piano and you just every day for an hour practiced chopsticks, you would not only be the most annoying piano player in the world, but you, after 20 years, that doesn't make you a virtuoso. You're just really good at doing that. Um, and you've never gotten any better. Deliberate practice should be fatiguing. It should be challenging. And so that's how we keep ramping that up. That's the difference between 10,000 hours of doing the same thing over and over again and becoming a virtuoso or a master of something. And they see this here at aviation, special operators, firefighting, astronauts, business executives, lawyers, doctors, whatever it might be, because the standard of excellence is constantly changing. We are chasing it. And so that's what we see when we go along is talking about what are some of these traits of high performers. If you think of Dick Fosbury, who was the first person in the Olympics to go over the bar backwards, the high jump bar backwards in the 1968 Olympics, he was laughed at before he did that. And then he did it and everybody started doing it afterwards. They couldn't do it really well beforehand because, well, that's because there wasn't a landing mat before the 68 Olympics or at least 64 uh, out of the Olympics. So you can't do it that often. You look at Flojo, what a great, great female sprinter she was in the Olympics. She had just this perfect science of how long her stride length and her angle she came out of the blocks in. You got to perfect that. And then Milo of Croton is what we call the father of progressive resistance. And these people all talk about, these are the traits of high performers. They use art, they use science, they use grit. Art is seeing things a new way. How can we challenge ourselves or think about it from a different angle? The science is perfecting that craft. That comes through a lot of practice and repetition and refinement. But grit is just being able to do it over and over and over again. That Milo that I mentioned before, Milo of Croton, famous uh, Greek wrestler from days of old. And the legend was that he was someone that lifted a calf every day when he was a kid, lifted a calf every day. And as he got older, and the calf got bigger and became a bull, he became stronger every day. That's that progressive resistance. That's deliberate practice where things get a little harder, a little harder. So maybe just a legend, but apply it in the way that you see going forward. And when we talk about coaching, that's even more important because what coaching is, a lot of times people define it as, well, it's just something you do. It's, it's management, it's leadership, it's inspiration. And I actually found there's six false coaching personas. There is the drill instructor where we just tell people what to do and saying they're not working hard enough. And back in my day, we did this a lot harder and we didn't have the internet. Or the preacher where we're always trying to inspire people and give them motivational things. And then they walk out of the room and nothing happens. It's useful. It's not entirely coaching. We also have the reminiscer uh, who thinks back on how we did things before which is not real helpful unless you have a time machine as a coach, the backseat driver who wants to tell you everything, how they would do it, the Monday morning quarterback where they talk about afterwards, well, this is all the ways you went wrong, or the coach that's just the bean counter that's just counting activities and, and how many meetings you had. These are all elements of coaching, but they're not coaching. And what coaching really is, is this art, science, and grit, once again, of repetitively helping others become better than they were yesterday very important distinction as we look forward to what we're actually trying to accomplish. So I'm going to talk about simulations and war games, but to put it into context, there's five elements of great coaching that everybody should be doing. Number one is focusing on fundamentals constantly. You need to break down what are the core competencies and skills of your workforce, whether that is writing code, whether as disaster preparedness or selling. What are the things like in selling, for example, it's discovery, it's uh, prospecting, it's closing deals, it is being able to handle objections, whatever that is, we know what it is. And in any domain in the world, we focus on fundamentals and do drills and practice. But for some reason, we get into the business suite and we stop doing them, except when we're on the job, when some, a million dollars is at stake. Try talking to a pilot about that approach. They'll laugh you out of the room. It's not professional and it's dangerous. So we can take a hint, more emphasis on fundamentals as a coach. Also more emphasis on situational planning as a coach. 
there are probably eight to 10 outcomes that happen 90% of the time at your business, maybe just three, where you run into two competitors or doing nothing is the biggest competitor. There is no reason these things should be a surprise. We do situational planning. You look at Sully Sullenberger, that uh, US Airways flight 1549 going from LaGuardia to Charlotte. That's exactly what that was. Situational planning. What do I do if we have a bird strike? What do we do if we have two bird strikes? But the last part of that really is simulation because Sully, they hadn't practiced landing in the Hudson River before. That was new. So he did not have the benefit of that simulation. I almost guarantee you though, pilots do that now in simulation. And they don't do it by practicing landing planes in the ocean. They do it in flight simulators. And we can create these in our, in our same environment. Simulation is critical. This is the zero buoyancy tank uh, down in NASA in Houston. And this is where they practice literally putting batteries on satellites or putting a new, uh, fixing something that's broken. And they sit there with a socket wrench and they turn it like this. And they're in these 300 pound suits and they do it for six to eight hours underwater. It's amazing. But when you lose a wrench in space, it costs a billion dollars because you got to send up a new rocket for it. So we're going to practice this and simulate everything that can go wrong. And then coaches use reflection on the simulation. What happened? What was supposed to happen? How could that be better? How do we do it better next time? What fundamentals to work on? What situations did we not master? Simulate, see how we do it again, because that leads to continuous improvement. And we're constantly measuring that. So simulation really becomes a tool for us to do these things. So these simulations in war games as we move forward, it really is about story living. We talk a lot about storytelling when it comes to how to train people. Um, we do lectures, we do um, asymmetric um, training with that there. We talk about um, you know, reading on your own and study and application and self-reflection and all asynchronous was the word I was looking for earlier that my mouth didn't properly do. <laughs> but simulations and war games, story living, can we put people in it? And that's really, really important. And if you think about going forward into these that we have, the superior preparation, what do people do at aviation? Now, you might recognize, for example, on the left there, uh, that is from the movie Top Gun. Um, and my, my father flew the lower plane there, that F-14. And we talked about how that worked. The problem was back in the Vietnam War, we were losing a lot. Um, it is down to a four to one ratio of win rates when planes would go against each other. Um, it went way up after the institution of Top Gun. But what they did is they sent all the things that could happen. They changed the rules to do all these things. Special operators, which way do we go into a door? If there's two people, if there's three people, if it's on the second floor. Uh, firefighters, if you look at an airport, uh, you will see, like at the end of when you're taking off from where you go next, look down, usually about toward the end of the runway, and you'll see this burned out fuselage looking thing. That's where they practice firefighting all the time. And of course, astronauts, this one here on the side, this is what they call the vomit comet, which is a modified KC-135 that goes up in the air in a parabolic. And when it goes over that, where you feel like a roller coaster going over the top, that goes on for about 30 seconds and they're floating weightlessly and they usually get sick. But we don't want to learn this for the first time when we're up in the air. And so I am going to share a video here. I hope this shows on your screen. Um, and if not, I'll be happy to send it to this is actually a simulation, for example, of the Hilo Dunker. They use this, and for anybody that doesn't enjoy being underwater, you can look away real quick. But this is them showing Marines how to handle it when your helicopter crashes and goes underwater. Now, these poor, probably 18, 19-year-old Marines are now in here. They're strapped in, they're put underwater, and they're turned upside down. You also might notice that they're wearing goggles that are blacked out, so they can't see. And they do this over and over and over again to be able to do it. And it's not fun. It's not ever. And in fact, when you ask them, when is the time that this gets easy? The answer is never. It never gets easy. It never gets fun because they keep making it harder as they do it. And those are the kind of things as we move forward that we need to start doing with all of our folks. 
break down your business into its pieces, those fundamentals. So if you're a sales manager, we talk about how do we simulate some of these? So there's two sides of that simulation and war game. Simulations are really about, you know, how well can they do the skill? So one of the things that I'd like you to do is think about using a scrimmage as a simulation. So when you have a training session, the next training session for sales, for disaster recovery, for whatever the job uh, might be, really think about how can we um, put them in a simulation in the beginning of the training session. So if you were coaching, for example, a six-year-old soccer team, which is amazingly hard. <laughs> but if you're doing that, what do you do on the first day? You usually just throw them out on the field and they run around like crazy people chasing a ball. And then the coaches and the parents sit back and say, okay, that one's pretty good. Oh my goodness, that one's terrible. We got to work on that. And you see the natural inclinations of your performers. I believe you should be doing this, a simulation that is a scrimmage, very unstructured, in the beginning of your training sessions, start with five minutes of introduction, what you're going to cover today, and then give them a scenario, a role play scenario where they work in groups of three, one person playing a client, one person playing a customer, one person as an observer, and then just really, um, without a lot of instruction, make them do it. And you make them do something that they do for a living. They're selling, they're, they're having a meeting, they're doing a presentation. This is something they already do. So when they push back and they say, well, wait a minute, you haven't taught us anything yet. Well, if a client called us right now and asked you to present, you'd go. So go ahead. And it really gets them, the juices flowing early in a training session. And it also shows them they have a lot to learn very early. And it completely changes the framework. Then you can start training them how to do better. And then you do one at the end to demonstrate the difference. It needs to be really related to actual job tasks. So we don't want to have these kind of uh, stimulations that are teaching things they've never seen before, right? At, with that, we need to make sure it applies to their actual job. And it, the simulation should be customized to their types of clients, what you sell, what your company does for a living, et cetera. And you want to break it into many scenarios or components as well, because simulations become, can become overwhelming if they become too big. Work on pieces of it, the discovery process, the presentation process, the production process, really, really tight, and then make them more complex and bolt them onto each other. And this allows you to have a lot of this complexity. And so when I talk about simulations, you know, I would build like for a sales team, for example, what you would do is present you know, them a three paragraph, you're meeting with this person today, here's the purpose, here's what you're worried about, the goal of this meeting is to accomplish this. And then you give a copy of the simulation operation form to the person playing the competitor or the customer or whatever it might be, and they have slightly different information. And the person's gonna have to figure that out along the way. The other thing you can do, of course, is pre-record these in video role play platforms, because remember, we are planning for scenarios. We know what they are. We can use fundamentals we want them to work on, and we can create a library of these things to do. And this actually allows us to use them anytime we want. So video-based role play, like rehearsals platform, it is fantastic. I've used it myself, and this is what I want people to do before they go out and practice on a client where there's a lot of money at stake. Now, a war game is slightly different. This is a competitive simulation, but it requires a lot more planning and organization. And a typical thing, what would you do? Let's say one of your teams is preparing to do a great big presentation to your biggest client. And it's the value of this meeting is millions of dollars. Well, we could just talk about it in the elevator or we can war game it. Now, simulation, we could practice it. But war game it means I'm going to take other members of my organization and have them play our competitors, right? So think about who your top three competitors are. And one of them might be doing something in-house instead of hiring you, right? And you have those people, they're opt for, the opposing force. If that person was the ABC company is your competitor, use ABC company tactics, use their website for information. You do that and you are literally trying to beat 
the team playing your cells. We call that the blue team, your team, and all the other three teams are red teams. And you go through a simulation, a live simulation, where you have actors or people in your organization playing the people that are making the decision. And at the end of it, you have referees and judges to make a determination who won. And it allows you to say, wow, that strategy didn't work. Wow, we really got caught when it comes to cost and delivery promises. Mm, we got to work on that. Oh, fundamentals, situational planning, simulation, reflect, do it again. So that's really the difference between simulations and war games. Simulations can be small. War games are really more expansive. So we use them more in the bigger things. So when we look at where these are, so many simulations, this is how we can use them. Many sims are things like rehearsal or video role plays, or even just back and forth across Zoom. Uh, hey, I'm going to go meet with a customer today. I know price is going to come up. Let me work on that. Work on the price objectives or do it live. Or you're about to pick up the phone and have a price discussion. So I'm going to do three or four price practices before I do it for real on the fourth time when I actually start dialing. It could be something like, you've had um, a problem with one of your product offerings and customers are calling and yelling at you. So we got talking points or objection handling. We're just simply putting in the reps. Mission simulations, um, you should be doing at your sales kickoffs and other meetings. Um, you should, everything that you train should always have simulations to cement it in place. And you should do multiple ones of them throughout the event and they should get progressively harder. I do encourage you to use a similar story and format so you keep building on it. And you also put people in groups of three. So when doing the sim, being the person they're talking to and an observer and you rotate it. So every three repetitions, they get a new one and they get to take a break and watch it from the other side. That's really helpful. This also helps when we do dress rehearsals for a big sales call or a big production meeting or whatever, a client discussion, and also deal with worst case scenarios that maybe we had never thought of. When we talk about on the war games, we do it in the beginning. So if you are a leadership team, we're thinking about changing our entire brand. All right, let's game it out. Let's uh, try to put that brand in front of a fake customer and put a, put a team together that are competitors and see what they would say about it and see, oh, we didn't think about that part. That is a problem. Hmm. So before we launch it, we do that. Works with products, helps with decision makings. And then also leadership development. And if anybody is a Star Trek fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Kobayashi Maru, that is a no-win situation. It's a great tool to put new leaders and leaders in development into no-win situations. Put them in simulations and war games where they cannot win. And we watch how they deal with it. Um, where do they flounder? Where do they get stuck? And that is where we do no fundamentals and situational planning and simulation to make them better. But you put them in no wins to determine that. And then finally, the ones at the end, really, if we're going after uh, a big account where I've worked with law firms and they're gonna do the BP oil spill litigation and they're making an argument in front of a jury that is gonna be worth billions of dollars, uh, maybe we should practice that a few times with different corporate counsel and different jurors and different judges and game it out to really see where we could fi find a problem if we don't do it the right way. We learn from failure here, not out there. And that's kind of the overall theme with that. These takeaways, let's learn like those people who, when they have a choice of really dangerous circumstances, this is how they choose to train. This is how they make their people better. And we will never have those circumstances, but they still are binary. We win or lose. We get the deal, we don't get the deal. Um, we win a case, we don't win a case, whatever it might be. So let's adopt their training method. Document your top five challenges, practice them incessantly, make them harder, and acknowledge the fact that atrophy is natural. It's good. We don't want to remember the way we sold 15 years ago. It's no longer useful. We're doing it this way today, but people a year ago are forgetting what we trained them also. That is the natural state of things. So use technology really to scale things up because I know we're all very busy. Use teams so people are not on their own. Minimum of three, maximum of nine, I actually think. That's how they do it in those other industries. And you need coaches to help with the refinement. You need someone to look at those videos. 
to refine their simulation performance, to give them specific pieces where they can improve. Because simulations and war games give people an arena to practice. That's where this is. We learn here, and so we don't learn here. It's too late. And no matter what our domain is, the principle applies and the circumstances can be just as severe. So I want to say thank you very much for your time today. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and just go full on camera. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, we're having a really interesting conversation in the chat about attention spans of learners today. And yeah. we're also all very impressed by your ability to ignore all of those sirens in the background. Huh. Oh, I, uh, I, I assure you, I am not in any sort of trouble. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> I live in the middle of downtown DC and uh, I live right by the Capitol. And so there's always something going on. Well, the cops haven't busted into the background. So we believe I got a good you. <laughs> yeah, they're practicing. All right. I wasn't so, able to see the chat. So I apologize for not responding to anything live. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's fine. We do have one question I figured we'd address right now. <laughs> it's kind of related to the attention span. How do you get learners in non life and death jobs to be willing to do the kind of difficult, lengthy practice that you're talking about when learners seem to have much shorter attention spans now and try to prefer to avoid things that seem difficult? Yeah, so I think you have to make it part of a, a a culture, a, a snacking culture of training. I don't think people will set aside time to say, okay, for an hour, I'm going to work on this. I mean, if you're going to learn how to play the guitar and you're going to learn how to play golf and stuff, you got to put in the time and the reps, but we have pressures, right? We have attention span pressures. I have things I have to deliver, whatever. Coaches and leadership need to find ways to send people 90 second ways to practice, two minute ways to practice. What is the objection of the day? Um, you know, Derek's company, Jeff's company rehearsal does a really good job at this. I mean, if at eight o'clock every day, it got sent, to, you know, today's challenge, right? Go through it. And maybe it's not even reviewed by a coach, but it's just their way of, you know, someone says a customer calls today and is very upset at your new pricing schedule. Handle this objection. Getting into the habit of those. Um, and then the other thing too, that's very helpful is adding a competitive nature to it. There's something that I talked about fighter pilots before. Uh, Navy pilots, when they land on an aircraft carrier, they have to catch a wire. Number three wire actually is the perfect way to do it. Um, they're all expected to do this. This is their job, right? But they're graded on it every day, whether they're a first day on the carrier or 20 year pilot. And they up on the wall, they have something called a greeny board, G-R-E-E-N-I-E, -E -E. you can look it up. And it is a grade for the entire world to see of how many good landings you did, how many bad ones you did. And it is shocking how self-correcting that is um, when you put that out there of just the minor things you're expected to do. So instead of making simulations elaborate, make them just day-to-day -day things they're expected to do, make them small and do them over and over and over and over again every day. That's better. And then on your big events, have all that. And people will start to self-identify like, mm, I'm okay at objection handling, but when they bang up price, I'm terrible. And they seek out more training. It helps them self-identify where to spend time on instead of just randomly going through an hour of training every day and trying to figure out what I should do. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we had one person in the chat asking if you could share your contact information again. Yeah, absolutely. More questions. Actually, what I'll do to uh, make sure that I don't confuse it with my real day job, uh, I will put my uh, other email address that's related to my book in here, uh, dc at artsitesgrit.com uh, with that there. I guess I should get a tattoo of that one of these days, but 